Thank you very much for joining us once again. In many parts of northern Ghana, hundreds of girls are being married off against their will. Often, the education of these teenagers is cut short. But with no one to help out, many of these youngsters suffer in silence in their villages. Upper East Region correspondent Albert Sori spoke to some of these underaged brides in the Upper East Region town of Naga for our latest hotline documentary, Tender Brides of the North. Here are excerpts. Alice, as we have chosen to call her, is 14 years old. Her feminine features are not yet so visible. In the blue jersey she is wearing over a green pair of shorts, Alice can easily be mistaken for a young boy if one is looking at her from the back. The innocence on her face and the shyness with which she narrates her story to Joy News prove only one thing. Alice is a child, and there is nothing about her that should make any man want to take her as a wife. But when Alice paid her elder sister a visit at Du in the northern region, she was forcibly taken by some unknown men to a house where she was being held, ostensibly because she had been taken in marriage. We came back from the farm and heard that someone was launching his music. So my elder sister and I went to the venue. While we were there, some young men came and forcibly took me to their house. They said they had married me. I had never seen them before. Alice was made to return to her sister's house the very day she was taken. This was because she refused to eat anything her abductors gave her. After moving back to her sister's house, Alice knew that she was no longer going to be subjected to the ordeal of living as a wife at that tender age. But that was not to be. A few days later, Alice was taken again by these same young men when she went to fetch water from the community borehole. This time, the escape was easy because the man who had been asked to keep an eye on her was asleep. She ran back to her sister's house and immediately packed the few clothes she had and ran back to Naga where she had come from. But Alice's troubles were still far from over because her abductors would not so easily give up. They came here and said they had spoken to the chief and he gave them permission to come for me because I don't go to school and I am not married. According to them, the chief said he will send someone to come and talk to my mother so they can take me away. I have since become afraid because I don't want to marry anyone. And the full hotline documentary, Tender Brides of the North, will air on Joy News or Moto TV on Monday at 6.30 p.m. Meanwhile, the gender minister, uh, Otiko Afisa Jaba, has linked the problem of child marriages to poverty. The Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection has been working on it, and we've had a national dialogue on uh, early childhood betrothals and marriages. Um, I think the First Lady actually also organized the program on it, the former First Lady. And so it's an issue to do with poverty, largely, that uh, parents and carers who cannot afford to take care of their families would give their girl children out before 18. So it's something that is very worrying because for Ghana to accelerate the development, Everybody must be in school. So if a marriage is curtailing your education, we need to do something about it. And that will start with a lot of dialogue. So we're going to have other dialogues and the focus group discussions concerning this issue, advocacy to sensitize people about the negatives in these early marriages and the positives in allowing the girl child to finish her education. And when the girl gets pregnant because she's too young, it uh, develops into fistula. 
and that is another challenge for her because the stigma of it is a problem. So it has all sorts of negatives. And a young girl, how does she bring up the child properly? So I am very, very concerned about it. And uh, being a mother of two, I have two girls and two boys. I wouldn't want my girl child to be affected that way. So we have to look at how we can get a lot of our parents cut off from poverty. Poverty is a stigma, it's a canker, and the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030, is to eradicate poverty and leave nobody out. I just came back from New York, and I've learned some few things, new things, about how we can handle poverty. If we are able to reduce and eradicate poverty, I believe that all these social issues will be a thing of the past. You you talk about advocacy and other things you intend to do specifically. What can you do about this and when do you intend to start? I myself started my public career doing Kokoroko, so I know the power of media. We will use one, the media, to advocate and depict stories of the positive and the negative. Stories of uh, girls who have been affected by, for instance, early marriage, those who have been weaned out of it, how have we tracked them? Are there any good stories? Have they changed in terms of their life, in terms of having equal opportunities? Because when you force a girl to get married, you're taking her right to decide. Every year, thousands of children in Ghana are sent to Lake Volta to a life of modern slavery in fishing industry. Though there's scanty data on the situation, more than 20,000 children are believed to be working on the Volta Lake as child slaves. Ghana passed an anti-human trafficking law close to 20 years ago, but a lack of resources for the police and the right campaigners mean very little has been done to save vulnerable children who fall victim to the menace. A Justice Bader report, Volta Lake, and has filed this report. Lake Volta, the world's largest man-made lake, does not only provide electricity for Ghana, but also put food on the tables of many families who fish in it. But this lake, with all its rich history, is also a dungeon of modern-day slavery for thousands of children. When you take the child, all the fishermen go and take the child to Toko for fishing, you use them for fishing because we, the others, we can go through under the water when the net is hooked there. So we send the child to go there to remove the net for us. But when they are going and then they don't remove the net, you force them to go. And then sometimes someone has not come back again. 12-year-old Kofi Jilanyo was once a slave here. He's now free, but only because he broke his spine. He had a broken spine when he slipped in a canoe and knocked the seat with his chest. He comes from Adafiano, a village some 200 kilometers away from Pando. My grandmother sold us, me and four brothers. She said if we don't go and work to take care of her, she would kill us when she dies. Adafiano. A community barely 30 minutes away from Ghana's border with Togo. It's a coastal community and people here are mainly small-scale fishermen. The landscape here is very sandy. That does not support any form of farming at all. That means that people here depend mainly on the sea. Now, fishing itself is a seasonal activity and barely any form of economic activity go on in the minor fishing season. It is in poor and vulnerable communities like this one that parents in their desperate need to survive sell off children to work in dangerous areas like the Volta Lake. I promised him I would look for his grandmother and tell him about his current situation. He had doubts about me finding her, but still had a message for the grandmother. Anyway, I 
Kaja wa vyao cha mikuwa jibu wapi wakula vya abo. Kakala kuwa wakula midi, edo wa umi jini. Jima wako mina mari. Na matibale kufuwa mingi. This is Kojo. He's also 12 years old and one of the thousands of boys still on this league. <laughs> Working as child slaves, children like Kujo in this small island called Wujidiada, which means when you finish eating, sleep in Ghana's eastern region work for 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and are given one small meal every day. But that meal is not even guaranteed. Sometimes they are denied food as a form of punishment. Ghana passed an anti-human trafficking law in 1995, but very little has been done in enforcement. Justice Beidu, Joy News, Adafiani. <laughs> story there. Well, Challenge and Height is an NGO that partners with other international agencies to deal with this challenge. I'm joined in the studio now by the President, James Kofian, and thank you very much for joining us on News Day, saying good morning to you. Good morning, and thank you for having me. I'm sure you watched this video. What was going through your mind as you were seeing the visuals that we just showed? Well, it's definitely a very sad story. Um, <clears throat> you can see the tears flowing out of no effort. And um, I've seen this over and over again, and uh, that is why I am so passionate about talking about this issue. Today, uh, you know, I do also write. Today, my article is based on issue of human trafficking. And um, we have asked the Ministry of uh, Gender to ask for money. What we need is money. If we need, if we have money, not to me and not for, for my NGO, but if the Ministry of Gender has money, they can turn the tears into um, joy or something. So for like you, that. you're saying that the gender ministry must dedicate uh, some special funds to deal with human trafficking, child trafficking to this There is actually a fund that is right. I mean, the fund has been there for about 12 years now since the Human Trafficking Act was passed. Mm. But they don't put money in. I mean, there have not been, but even when there are budgetary allocations, they, they are not released. And therefore, we still are confronted with this challenge. But on a, a more, more broader and uh, I would say specific um, issue of trafficking, you see these children um, that are crying, we are talking about over 21,000 of them. Not, it's not only those who are working, but we are talking about those who are enslaved. So for those who are working on Lake Water, there are 49,000. Those who are enslaved, they were bought and sold, actually with money. Parents taking money from fishermen and actually giving their children out. We're talking about 21,000. Mm. And we are talking about 21,000 children who are losing their future. They don't go to school. They have no opportunity to go to school. They work virtually 17 hours a day. How many hours a day do you work? And they work from 3 a.m. and end at 8 p.m. Sometimes they work overnight in the cold. And usually they work without wearing any clothes on. And these are, the, these are our own children. And we continue to say the children are our future leaders. So that's how we are training our future leaders. And it's absurd. I wish that everyone will have the opportunity to go to that lake water from Pando to Bupe. Just go and see. Don't go and take any charge. Just go and see the mass of children who are released on the lake every day just working and being abused and tortured in a manner that you will not wish for the child of your worst of enemies. Hmm. Why? Is it that there is not any you know, system in place to stop this? Because the numbers you're mentioning are huge. They are huge. 
There is a system in place. I mean, we have the anti-human trafficking unit of Ghana Police Service. I know of that one. We, we have the, uh, the anti-human trafficking secretariat of the Ministry of Gender. To deal with that, we have a national plan of action to, to arrest the issue of trafficking. In fact, even within the IOCO, there's a secretariat there that looks at human trafficking. So there are a whole lot. But you know our country. Why does it keep recurring? when we have all these units in place. Because I mean, you've been in this job for, for more than 12 years. Why does it keep recurring? It is, it's not functioning. You know, and for about 10 years, the anti-human trafficking unit of Ghana Police Service did not have a vehicle. Eventually, it had one vehicle. And when it broke down, it was kept for about two years without being repaired. It's recently that the US government has uh, supported um, uh, Ghana in certain amount of money that they bought some additional vehicles. We have the Human Trafficking Secretariat of the Ministry of Gender that two years ago, the entire budget for operations was less than 200,000. And even that, it was not released. And you know how much we work with as an organization. We have our own rescue boats. We have our own vehicles that rescue. We have personnel that works. So if you have a ministry that has less, less capacity, than an NGO like Challenging High, then you are in trouble. So you're, you're you mentioned some amounts of money. What amount? How much was it? About two years ago, it was just about 200,000 that was budgeted for the operations of the Human Trafficking Secretariat of the U Ministry of Gender. And even that was not released. Dollars or CDs? CDs. I'm talking about CDs. Mm. An amount that in my organization we use within a month. So that's woefully inadequate, you say? Very small. So shameful. Shamefully small. And I am I've asked today, how much is the ministry action to address this issue? In our estimation, we think that even if we allocate five million a year to address this issue, in the next five years we'll be able to end this. I would say nonsense. Excuse me to use that language. Mm, and this money you're talking about, apart from providing vehicles for the resource, um, the the agencies that are supposed to enforce anti human trafficking or child trafficking thing, how would it go into dealing with the problem? You see, we need, we have in every region um, anti-human trafficking unit of Ghana Police Service. They need to be resourced. So you push some of the resources there. We have the Human Trafficking Secretariat in the ministry that needs to coordinate all activities of human trafficking. They need to be resourced. They need personnel. In fact, in the, in, um, in the strategy, they need to have 26 staff. As I speak to you now, they are not even up to 10. So you need to resource them. Apart from that, you also need to build the capacity of the police in terms of uh, training, in terms of um, um, intelligence gathering, and so on and so forth. Even the immigration. When you go to the lake, we have immigration service personnel all around. They need to be resources. Uh, resource. We also need to build the capacity of the social welfare unit to be able to address the issue. In fact, within the law, it stated that every region must have a rehabilitation shelter for children victims. We don't even have one. In Accra, we have one uh, shelter at Osu. If you go there, it shares the same uh, facility with the Bosa in home. Ch these children need not to share shelter with those uh, Bosa What children. kind of environment do they need? They need an environment of, of de-traumatization. These are children who have been sexually abused in very big way. And I will tell you, the girls, when they are sent to the lake, they are used as sex materials to service the older boys and service the masters. And you can imagine a grand girl serving about three men for about five, six years. Just imagine. So that child has been battered, has been destroyed. You need a certain exclusive atmosphere in order to counsel that child give nutritional support, and create some atmosphere for literacy and assurance. You can't add that child to a bus So there home. should be like a rehab home exactly. for these children? Exactly. We have one. Challenging Hive, has our, we have our own rehabilitation center. And if you go there, it's a delight to watch. When these children come, they, they're resilient. Although they've gone through this uh, torturous situation, they have a lot of resilience. Mm. All they need is that atmosphere of love. Uh, how, many, how many children do you have in, in your home right now? Uh, right now we have about 35. We were having about 54 and we re reintegrated them. It's not a home. So when you come after 
three to nine months, you have to go back to your community uh, where you originally come from so that we can have a space for another set of and children. And that's actually very important. How do you reintegrate them back into society, into their various families? How do you do that? Well, you know, because of what they've gone through, we have this program of re-traumatizing them. It includes medical care, it includes counseling, basic education, and so on and so forth. Now, when we see that they are prepared to go back home, we know that it's poverty that also drives the, the trade. And so we set the women, that, especially their mothers, up in business. And we counsel them using both the law and what we know to counsel them. Once we finish with that and we set them up in business, we are able to now bring the children to live with them. We don't pursue prosecution because we don't have the capacity for that. But assuming we bring these children back to you, and we already we've set you up in business, and you fail, and the child ends up back on the lake, we will pursue with all the resources that we have, we'll put it behind you, pursue prosecution, go to jail. That is why you might have heard in the news that a number of uh, um, parents have gone to jail as a result of the trafficking children. Mm -hmm. We try to do that to serve as a deterrent to other um, um, parents who will, do, who, who will traffic their children. So that is the reintegration. Once we bring the child back to the parents, having resourced them, we take them to school and we sponsor the education for at least a year or two with the hope that once the parents have been resourced and they are doing their businesses, by one year time, they should be able to get enough profit to take care of their own children. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what we are expecting from the government. And, and so I, I assume that there are some who have already been reintegrated back into the society. Of course. What has been the story of these children, for instance? There are, I mean, we have a lot of them. We, if we, go to, we have a school. If you go to our school, for instance, you will see um, the carpentry work, all the carpentry work done in our school were done by past children we reintegrated who have gone through vocational skills and are doing well. Uh, uniform is owned by such children. Uh, there's so much, I mean, we have a welder who is doing very well. We have very, even people who are teaching. Mm. You know, if you come to our school, some of our teachers actually went through our program. So there have been very, very good stories. And look at me, I have a master's degree. I write like something. I'm, I was once a victim. Mm. So you can just look at the resilience, the talent of these children, and we look on, you and I, we look on as 21 children perish on the lake. Mm. And uh, for you, from based on how you're talking, it seems that we haven't had the national body really committing a lot of resources and other things into dealing with this problem. How do you think we can get the national bodies involved in this, dealing with this problem? One of the first steps that I think you have taken is to uh, talk about it today. And I want to congratulate one particular person uh, in Joy News, uh, Justice Beidou. I think he's followed this up a number of times. I've done a lot of interviews with him. Uh, that guy needs to be commended for his work in this area. Uh, and the, we need to keep the pressure. Government of Ghana stands to lose over five hundred million dollars from the US government if we don't address this issue. Remember that last two years the US government rated us in their trafficking persons report rated us to tier two watch list. Last year that tier two was repeated. It means that we are on our way to tier three. What it means is that once we get to tier three there are certain benefits that we cannot get. That includes some aid, like the Millennium Challenge uh, account, like um, some USAID programs. We we'll lose all of them. I want you to break this thing down for us. You're talking about Ghana losing 500 million. Is it annually? Annually. If we don't yeah. deal with if it. If we don't deal how with do it. We, how do we lose this money? Because, you see, there are conditions applied to some of these aid and, and programs. So, for instance, one of the conditions applied to the Millennium Challenge account is for you to address the issue of human trafficking or modern day slavery. If you don't do that, you start to lose it. The USAID has similar conditions. And so now there are so many bilateral agreements that comes with conditionalities of you taking steps to address the issue of modern slavery and human trafficking. So once you don't do that, then you are on your way to losing those benefits. And in fact, last year, the US government issued a warning, direct warning to our government that we stand to lose those kind of uh, 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 programs.
And I know that quite recently, is it a week or less, you actually rescued some people who were, some children who were also going to be trafficked. Tell us the circumstances. Yeah, we, I mean, we did um, 18 children. We, they were rescued from uh, Kafaba to the, Kafaba is in the northern regions uh, to somewhere in uh, water region. Um, in about eight different communities. Uh, the children are aged between 5 and 17. They are currently in our rehabilitation center, going through rehabilitation as we prepare their mother to receive them in the next uh, three or four months. Um, the previous, last year, we rescued about 60 children in total. And so far, since Challenging Heights uh, had been started, we have rescued over 1,500 children uh, from slavery and supported you know, more children. Now, usually we have referrals from the parents, from police, from social welfare, and from our own community child protection committees that we have formed, and our staff who are on the field. That's how we get our information before we go to the uh, destination communities to rescue them. It, rescue is a very robust, tedious activity. Sometimes we get a lot of resistance from the fishermen, and they even attack us. Even sometimes when we go with policemen with guns, they still attack us. Because with what? They t attack us. Yes. They, well, they resist. <laughs> they, sometimes they just fight. They don't fear the police. Because, you see, they have bought the children. At one point in time, I remember last year we rescued four children. The, the, the man who sold his own four children sold the children for 500 Ghana cities. Four children for 500 Ghana cities. Now, that person who has bought those children aims at recouping that money quickly and make profit out of them. If you are coming for those children, well, you are signed a contract for maybe four, five years. What are you doing to his business? You are collapsing his business. He's not going to allow you to do that. He's not going to recruit adults to work for him He's not going to get that profit that he will get out of those children. So they will resist and sometimes get very, very violent. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, that's the work we have been doing. So we are not afraid. But we want, to, we want the government to set the pace. Obama, the ex-president of America, anywhere he has gone, traveled to in the world, he, in his speech, at least he will dedicate about 30 seconds for human trafficking. How many times have we heard our president mention human trafficking? You don't, because it's not part of our, their priority. But let's remember that all over the world, even the Vatican is doing a program on human trafficking. The UK is doing a program on human trafficking. The American government is using, doing a program in human trafficking. And I'm involved in all of these things that I've mentioned. We cannot ignore that human trafficking is a problem. We have to accept the fact that it's a problem. That is why we pass a law. We have to accept the fact that it's a problem. That's why we created a secretariat for it. And we have to accept that once we have accepted that it's a problem, we have to dedicate money for it. Thank you very much, Mr. James Kofianan. And he's the president of Challenging Heights, an NGO that deals in child trafficking, also partners with other international agencies to deal with the problem. And he's been sharing his thoughts on, uh, uh, with us, uh, as well as what they've been doing to deal with the problem. Now, moving on, a year ago today, Ghana woke up to the news of the death of Joseph Bwachi Dankwedu, member of parliament for Ebuakwa North. As the news unfolded, as came to light, it came to light that the MP was stabbed to death by a known assailant. The incident, according to the then Greater Accra Regional Police Commander, COP George Dampare, occurred at dawn on Tuesday, February 9, at his residence at Shiashi in Accra. Derek Echo Sam visited his residence on that day. <laughs> I'm 
case is still in court and we also understand that there will be a memorial church service later today at the Accra Ridge Church and we'll bring you live feed from there. You're still watching News Desk on Joy News.